So today, section 34, 34, yeah, will be on recommendation engines. So a really quick agenda. Uh, we're going to look at the different kinds, the different broad genres of recommendation engines, uh, the main concepts behind each kind of engine, and also we'll talk about the pros and cons of the different ones and when to use which. So there are several different kinds of recommendation engines, which I will talk about this slide and also why. So there are three main types of engines. First, you have non-personalized, which I'll talk about, I think, the slide right after this. Content-based, which is basically like, you know, recommending based on an item itself. And also collaborative filtering. And actually, the labs, the Learn Labs on Section 34, focus mostly on collaborative filtering, because that's like the new concept that we're learning here. Um, I'll go into this later as well, but content-based recommendation engines can actually be done with the algorithms that we already have learned during, uh, up till this point in the course. So uh, why do we need recommendation engines and what are some examples? Um, I don't know, what are your favorite recommendation engines? <laughs> Anyone? Amazon, tell me what other products I need. What other books I should read is usually actually how I use it. <laughs> mm, yeah, that's a really great example. Do you have, do you have any Nessera that you like to use? Um, can I say for, for example, Etsy because I can find some stuff for the gift. Yeah, absolutely. Etsy actually has a really good data set for making recommendation engines. So I think like there's a good, it's, I'm not sure if it's an API or if it's, an, if it's a data set, but I've had uh, quite a few students use there's to create like very different recommendations. So that's actually could be a possible project. Um, my favorite recommendation is actually like Facebook ads because I feel like they're always so targeted. I actually learned to like Google specific things that I'm looking for such that they'll feed me ads um, just so I can just see like different brands of like specific things that I want. Um, so I think that's an incredible recommendation engine. So we'll start with non-personalized recommendation engines, the simplest one. Um, and as the name says, it's not personalized. So examples of that is just recommending the top rated items, the most watched or consumed items, items who will give the companies the highest ROI. And some really quick pros and cons um, is that it's extremely easy to make recommendations, right? It's um, the same recommendations for everybody. Uh, for example, here I have like um, a screenshot of YouTube and this is YouTube with like no user. So like if you're a brand new user on YouTube, this is what they recommend to you. And as you can see here, it's a little small, but they just recommend you the top trending videos. Is it the most effective? It would depend, right? Um, sometimes you just don't have any information on people or products. So in that case, just make the recommendations that uh, make the most sense for you in, in the company, right? Um, I think a lot of these like new small brands that are coming out, um, I wouldn't be surprised if they chose to push items that would give them like the highest return on investment or something that they know will be very popular. Um, so yeah, if you're a new business where you don't have much data on content or on users, or if you really want to push certain items, that's a non-personalized recommendation. Um, so not too much data science that goes on behind this. So let's move on to the next one, content-based uh, recommendation engines. So this structure of data should look very, very familiar. Here we have like just a movie's data set where you have like genre, actor, director, and each row is a movie. So a content-based recommendation engine makes recommendations based on an item's features. And as I mentioned before, models that we already know can do something like this. Um, this is a slide deck that I used to use on campus as a little more interactive, but could you, would you have any, any idea of how you can use like an existing model that you know to build a recommendation engine? Maybe cluster what we have and the others coming and then according the features we have, I don't know, we, we have maybe several different uh, aspects we can measure by distance or whatever. So we can put it in different class, what I guess. <laughs> yeah, actually like 
I have like three points here and like you hit two out of three. Like the most basic one is actually to use distance metrics. So let's say you know that someone is looking at a page of like, I don't know, black shoes. And based on distance metrics, if you have information on like the color of the shoes, like maybe their shoe size, the material of the shoes, um, you can just recommend something that is mathematically close to that. So maybe you have other pairs of black shoes or other pairs of shoes with like a similar material, similar like heel height or something like that. Um, so with this is metric, which is literally, I think, um, yeah, the nearest neighbors model, um, scikit-learn has that where you can just like plug in a data frame, um, give it like an array of numbers and it'll show you like which of the rows are mathematically closest to your input. And that's actually like one of the easiest to implement um, content-based recommendation engines. You also mentioned clustering and clustering is extremely powerful in a very similar way and used in a very similar way. So you can cluster, imagine you have like a huge inventory of items. Um, you could first cluster your items such that you don't have to run your distance metrics on all of your items, right? So it kind of like makes your sample set a little smaller so that you can do that. Or through clustering, um, you can end up, you know, recommending like a whole group of items. Um, Netflix's algorithm kind of uses uh, clustering. And like, after I talk about like the other, the last kind of recommendation engine, I'll talk about like how Netflix does it. It's actually really interesting. Um, one more example that is a very specific example. It also really depends on the kind of data you have, but um, it's possible to build a classification algorithm. Uh, using a classification algorithm to build a recommendation engine. So like, let's say you just happen to have data on like, for example, you know, users on Netflix now, you can actually like thumbs up or thumbs down movies. So just based on that, you can build a little algorithm to see like, all right, is this person likely to thumbs up or thumbs down the movie? So that would just be your target variable and you just like train your regular classification mod three project kind of thing. Um, let's see, is there anything else? Any questions so far? So because we talked about the stints metrics, it's kind of like some just similarity metrics. So these are just five of the most common um, similarity metrics. Um, part of similarity metrics is also distance metrics. So we have Euclidean distance, which we you know is like the Pythagoras theorem one. Um, I think we've heard of cosine similarity in this course, kind of. Yeah, it's just another way of measuring similarity. So it's basically taking the angle between two vectors. So like if you have one point here, one point here, they'll measure the angle in between them. And then Pearson correlation. And actually very interestingly, um, through just like um, different people building content-based recommendation engines, I read a paper that says that Pearson correlation has just demonstrated to be the most effective one. How they measure that, I'm not too sure, but I read somewhere that they say that. Um, that happened to be the most effective one. Um, and I think we'll come back to this later. But cool. Some pros and cons of content-based recommendation engines. Um, so I built this slide deck about a year ago and I was trying to get into buying plants and I bought a plant and it died and I was really upset about it. However, all of my recommendations looked like this and they're like just rubbing it in my face. <laughs> so this goes to show some pros and pitfalls of content-based recommendations. Um, if um, you'll get very, very similar content recommended all the time. So one of the cons, or it could be a pro, if you like really like horror movies, for example, you'll only get recommended horror movies. Um, however, on the flip side, if a person has very specific tastes, you get very specific content. So let's say you have like a very niche um, enjoyment of, I don't know, I guess plants, let's go with plants right now. You'll get a lot of good recommendations in plants. Um, another keyword um, is that content-based recommendation engines get over the cold start problem. And so the cold start problem is like, it's a phrase saying that if you have no data, um, you can't make recommendations. So that means a cold start. Um, so let's say, so the good thing about content-based recommendations, it's easy to get over this cold start problem because once a new user clicks on an item, you already have something to go off of. And the and collaborative filtering, which we're gonna look at right after this, has a serious cold start problem. So 
post our problem, not a problem in content-based recommendations will be a problem in our next one. Um, before I move on, question? Cool. All right, so this is actually the bulk of what the labs go through, collaborative filtering. And to first understand collaborative filtering, we have to talk about the utility matrix. So looks a little bit intense, but a utility matrix shows user ratings of different items. So what we have here is we have users on, like each row is a user and each column is a different item. Um, so each column is a different movie in this case. And because not every user would have watched every movie, wouldn't have rated every movie, there are a lot of blanks. Um, and the idea is to fill in the blanks. And so what we call this is a sparse matrix because there are usually like, I most of the matrices that I've seen that you wanna do this kind of, um, collaborative filtering on, they're about like 90% blank. And so the idea is to fill in, the bit, fill in these blanks and then recommend the items with the highest predictions. So for example, in user one, user one has only seen movie one and movie n, and through filling in these blanks, we can see that, all right, movie two has like the next highest rating. Uh, the prediction is that user one will rate movie two a four, and so we'll recommend movie two. So that's the whole idea of how collaborative filtering works. All right, so collaborative filtering in a nutshell, it recommends items based on the ratings of other users. And there's actually several different ways to do it. Um, there's memory based, which is also known as uh, neighborhood based, where you're talking about user to user or item to item similarity. I'll actually walk through this algorithm in a little bit. It's pretty, it's not too complicated. And then there's the famous matrix factorization. And I think the labs actually walk through this, but I, it's, it's actually my all time favorite algorithm. So I'll also walk through it. Like, um, so I'll talk about, yeah, let's start with user to user collaborative filtering. This looks a little bit intense, but I will explain all the things on this page. So what I have here on the bottom left is a just a sample utility matrix. Um, it's usually not this filled up, but just for example's sake, imagine we only have four users and four items. And my goal here is to make a prediction for what user one will rate item three. So there's mainly two steps. First, we wanna see how similar is each user to user one, because we're trying to make this prediction for user one. And so what I did here in the second table is these values are the cosine similarity between user one and all the other users. So cosine similarity is measured between zero and one. So you can see that these are the similarity values between user one and every other user. Um, so after you get these similarity values, this predicted value is just a weighted average. And so as you can see here, I'm taking 0.65 multiplied by four, um, so here you see 0 0.65, 0 0.76, 0 0.83. These are these values. And then four, five, and four come from here. Four, five, and four. And so these are just the ratings that other users have, gave, have given item three. And then I'm dividing it by 2.24, which is the sum of this. So it's kind of a weighted average of other users, weight, of other users ratings. And then we get to this predicted rating of 4.34. Just one quick question. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't be the total of our rate be one because this one is more than one? Uh, you mean, oh, yeah, you the, mean this the part? The total, yeah, exactly. It shouldn't be mm -hmm. the one. Mm, so these are just the, uh, these are just the similarity values between one and two. So the similarity between one and two is 0.65. Similarity between one and three is 0.76. Does that answer your question? Yeah, because it's kind of the binomial, if I don't make a mistake. Or... Oh, okay, I see. Yeah. So it shouldn't be all of them be the one. It kind of, I think it's because it's taking a weighted average. So, because each of these, because we want to take like the, how do I explain this? It kind of takes into account that like, this is only 0.65 similar to user one. And therefore, we're only going to take 0.65 of that. And it doesn't need to be one because all of these, we're dividing it by their sum. So you can, you can actually normalize it to one, but you'll still get the same number. So if you took same like number. 
Yeah, so if you take like 0.65 divided by 2.24 and 76 divided by 2.24 and do the same calculation. So the, the exact that's will be one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Cool. So that's user to user collaborative filtering, which is basically comparing the similarity of users. Uh, before I go into the next few, here are some pros and cons of collaborative filtering. Uh, first, it's very, very personalized. You get your own prediction for each item. Um, however, as you can see, it's kind of computationally heavy in the sense that, like, you see, just to fill in this one number, we have to calculate, you know, first all the similarities of this and then do this weighted average. And so imagine if you have a lot of users and a lot of items, it takes a lot of computation, computational power. Um, and then there's, oh, there's a popularity bias as well. So based on this calculation, imagine if like all of these were fives, the rating that's predicted for user one and item three will be a five, right? So like basically if you've ever had an unpopular opinion on something, this, a situation like this, um, you won't be able, yeah, it won't be able to account for your unpopular opinions basically. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, the cold start problem, because if you had no information on user one, you wouldn't even be able to start computing the similarity between user one and anyone else. Um, yeah, and so therefore you wouldn't even be able to start doing collaborative filtering. And so collaborative filtering could only be done if you have some information on users or items. So after these pros and cons, just quickly, I'm not going to go through this because actually the exact same thing, but instead of doing the similarity across users, you're doing the similarity across items. So that's why this is item to item collaborative filtering. And as you can see, um, same matrix here, just the difference being that we're taking the similarities between items and then taking that weighted average. What's interesting to note that this prediction is 3.31, whereas the last one was 4.34. So because you're comparing the similarity across different axes, you can get very different numbers. But it's exactly the same calculation, just across a different axis. So user to user versus item to item, which is better? Um, this same reading, I forgot where I saw this. I, I have a textbook chapter that I will link out later. Uh, but item to item, item to item has just proven to be more effective since it's harder to predict users' unique tastes. Uh, so the idea of that is that you'd rather look at, all right, you'd rather compare the similarity across item than the similarity across users because comparing the similarity across users, you sort of lose the intricacy of each user within each item, if that makes sense. Um, and another way to decide which is better for your case, um, time complexity. Um, if you're doing user to user um, and you have um, user to user will be n squared of n basically because you're doing the similarity calculation first and then the um, and then the weighted average and then item to item would just be the other way around. Um, and so which would you rather do if you have a lot more users than items? So uh, uh, if I have a more user mm -hmm. and M is a user, I prefer to do the item by item. Exactly. Yeah. Great. And then I think I mentioned this earlier, but just experimentally Pearson correlation is like people's metric of choice to decide like um, similarity. As opposed to cosine similarity, which is what you actually used on the previous slides. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why I decided to use cosine similarity. I think it's just my default one, to be honest. Um, all right, so this is actually the main one that the, the labs walk through, which I think is incredible. Um, it's singular value decomposition, which is the name of the algorithm used to fill in the utility matrix via this method of matrix factorization. So matrix factorization sounds really intense, but factorization, I don't know if any, if you guys remember like back in like maybe like high school math, you need to like factorize a quadratic equation. So it's basically taking a quadratic equation and like representing it as like the product of two smaller parts. And that's literally what we're doing in this case. We're just taking this utility matrix 
and we're actually going to represent it as two smaller matrices. So that's like kind of like the concept of what's going on here. Uh, we're going to break down this utility matrix into a user and an item matrix with the other dimensions being latent features. So that's where, that's like kind of like PCA. And I'll, I have like diagrams coming up after this that will hopefully make it a little more clear. And then after that, you have gradient descent and it's a special kind of gradient descent um, alternating these squares to preserve the relationship between items and users. Um, it's very, very mathy, but best in class models use some form of SVD. Um, the Netflix competition that like was being held in like the late 2000s. Um, the first time someone used SVD was this guy named Simon Funk in like 2006 or seven, I forget. But he was given like a data set of like a bunch of movies and a bunch of ratings. And it was basically like asked to write an algorithm to predict these ratings. And he managed to predict it with like a 96% accuracy, which is crazy. And he used SVD to do this. And the algorithm that he used is actually like the one that's built in to like the, um, that one that's built into the library that we use to create these SVD algorithms, which is incredible. Um, so in a nutshell, not in a nutshell, but I guess more visually, this is the same utility matrix that we had before. And we're gonna represent it as an item matrix and a user matrix. Um, and if we kind of remember our uh, matrix multiplication, this value here is determined by this row here and then this, uh, this column here. And the number, of, the number of latent features is actually something that you would tune in your hyperparameters. Um, and yeah, that's just latent features. It doesn't really have any like true meaning about the item, but it's just some representation. And intuitively, you would be like, all right, we have to create these matrices, but it's kind of the opposite, which is, I think this part is like really, really elegant. So the idea here, because of the gradient descent, and if you remember like the idea of gradient descent, you always start with some initial values and then you try and get the cost function down, right? And so that's what we're doing here. We're actually initializing our two, um, our two component matrices first. And so in this example, I just decided to initialize it with all ones. So these are going to be all ones. And when we multiply it together, they all become twos. And the idea here is to try and create a utility matrix that is as close as possible to the original utility matrix. And the cost function that we're trying to minimize is the difference between this matrix and this matrix. So what I did here was just take an RMSE between like, let's say the, the first two here, oops, the first two here and the first four here. And then just like looking like cell by cell, that RMSE. And so that's the cost function they're actually trying to minimize here. And just to like keep track, the RMSE started at 1.75. Um, so gradient descent, we're actually gonna edit each of these. And then that's how our, that's, those are like the steps that we're taking to like improve our cost function. And so what's actually pretty elegant about this is that every time we change a number, so let's say I'm changing this first value, this first X value. Um, if I change this X value, this row is gonna be multiplied by all of these columns and change this entire top row here. Yeah, all right, yeah, it takes a bit of like time to sink in. But just know that if we're changing this top value here, it's going to affect all of these values in our utility, in our constructed utility matrix. And so we can actually minimize the error between this top row and this top row. And that's what this crazy equation looks like. We're just taking the RMSE between this top row and this top row. So you can see like four, two, three, and five. We're taking four, two, three, and five, each minus, minus saying x plus one. So we're taking that difference, and then we minimize this, um, take a derivative, set it to zero, and then the best x for this at this step in time is actually 2.5. Um, and so once we replace this with 2.5, everything multiplies out, 
and you can see that this top row becomes 3.5 and the RMSE goes down to 1.58 and I believe before it was 1.75. So RMSE has gone down. And so basically what we're doing here to like make this better and better is we're going to repeat that process for every single one of these, every single one of these ones. And not just once through, because once you change one of them, or once you do one pass, 2.5 might not be the best value anymore. So you keep doing that process over and over again until you, like, we don't even know what this is, but this, I think I actually ran this through the algorithm and it says that these are the values here. And so through doing that process over and over again, um, we, get, we end up with 3.7 and a final RMSE of 1.15. And what that means is just on average, our predictions are off by about like 1.15 out of 5, which I mean, 20% off is, doesn't sound great, but for something that we don't really know, like that there is no metric, there's no other metric to like, you know, see how good it is. That's pretty good. Um, one more thing to mention is there was a keyword back here of like parallelizable. And so what's really cool about this method of alternating least squares is that it preserves the relationship between items and between users. Because if you notice, every time we change like a single value, you're updating an entire row or an entire column at a time. And so that preserves the relationship between users and between items. And that is just like, apparently like a really cool, like parallelizable. That's like the keyword that people use for this algorithm. So yeah, that's SVD. I think the labs go in depth and there are a bunch of examples. Um, but as a summary, this is all the stuff that we talked about. Um, we had non-personalized, that one's straightforward. We have the content-based recommendation engines, which are like, you can use clustering, you can use classification, you can use um, distance metrics. And then in collaborative filtering, there are these, I believe like in the, um, in the library called Surprise, that is in, the library is called Surprise, and the one that's used in um, the labs actually does have the ability to do the user to user and the item to item, but most people just end up using SVD. Um, ooh, one more thing I forgot to mention. You see how like this predicted value was 3.7? 3.7 is actually nicely in between the other two predicted values. So this is 3.31. And the other one was 4.34. And so 3.7 is like nicely in between both of them because it takes into account both um, similarities. So I thought, I always think that's really cool. But yeah, um, that's pretty much all I have for REC systems. Um, yeah, any, any questions? <laughs> awesome. Yeah, the labs mostly are on collaborative filtering. Um, I found the way the labs explain it a little bit confusing. So maybe this, I don't know if this helps, it helps. I will also send out, um, I'll send out like one textbook and I'll point you all to like which chapter has a really good explanation of the, of the algorithm. Um, and yeah, I'll send a bunch, a couple other resources as well. But yeah, thanks y'all. Um, in the meantime, let me know if y'all need anything. Um, but yeah, let me stop this share.